We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Elizabeth Aloni, and I'm with Schneps Media. Schneps Media is the largest media outlet in Metro New York. We publish over 70 newspapers, magazines, websites, webinars, podcasts, and events throughout Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, Westchester, Long Island, and Philadelphia. Today, we are thrilled to bring to you this very important webinar, TAVR, Heart Valve Replacement, Are You a Candidate? And I am thrilled to be able to welcome Dr. Robert Minutello, Director of Cardiac Catheterization Lab at New York Presbyterian Queens and Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine, Division of Cardiology, Wheel Cornell Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Minutello. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Absolutely. So, um, I, yeah. I wanted to tell everyone a little bit about you. Sure. So Dr. Minutello is a renowned interventional cardiologist and has been named director of the Cardiac Catheterization Lab and director of structural heart disease at New York Presbyterian Queens. New York Presbyterian Queens is the most comprehensive cardiovascular program in Queens and the only hospital in the borough to offer transcatheter aortic valve replacement, TAVR, utilizing wheel Cornell medicine expertise and experience in performing the highly advanced procedure. Dr. Minutello specializes in angioplasty, stenting, and intervention, interventional management of valvular heart disease, including the TAVR procedure, which is a minimally invasive procedure involving replacing a failing aortic valve without the need for open heart surgery. He's been practicing at New York Presbyterian Wheel Cornell Medicine since 2003 and has served as director of the Interventional Cardiology Training Program at Wheel Cornell Medicine for the past 12 years. He is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology and the Society for Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions and has served on Wheel Cornell Medicine's Institutional Review Board as well as the Acute Coronary Syndrome Committee. Dr. Minutello's areas of research interest include transcatheter valvular and coronary intervention outcomes and is committed to helping train the next generation of cardiologists. So very hearty welcome to Dr. Minutello. Thank you. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, for that introduction. And um, actually, I've been involved uh, in some capacity with NYP uh, for the last 24 years. And um, I've seen um, TAVR grow uh, over the last couple decades, and it's very exciting to now finally be able to talk about TAVR in Queens, where we actually do the procedure for the, for the first time, as was mentioned. So as was uh, discussed, I'm going to speak to you. We, we mentioned what TAVR is indirectly, transcatheteric valve replacement. Um, the catchphrase is TAVR, since it rolls easily off the tongue. Um, but a few objectives. First of all, what is it exactly? You know, what is TAVR? Why is it a revolutionary treatment? Uh, treatment because it truly is. And I'm going to speak to you a little bit about the introduction of TAVR to Queens, which has been occurring over the last couple of years. Uh, my this talk this uh, talk will be about 10 to 15 minutes long. Um, and I do realize this is a very specific topic. So other topics uh, which are more general, such as for instance diet and health. Heart, uh, being heart healthy, um, you know, are more generic topics. This is a specific one. So I would imagine that our, our audience is filled with a variety of people, a heterogeneous group of people, those who uh, are simply interested in TAVR, who may think they need a TAVR, those who have had a TAVR, and those who may want to know a little bit more about the procedure specifically. So I'm going to try to make this talk and this webinar applicable to everyone as much as I can, and please ask any questions no matter how detailed or specific they are. So TAVR stands for transcatheter aortic valve replacement, and it is just what it, it sounds like. It's a, it's a way of replacing the valve through a catheter. So traditionally, and prior to this recent decade, the only option we really had for replacing a valve, truly replacing a valve, was with open heart surgery. This is a minimally invasive treatment for aortic stenosis, which is also a, a definitive treatment. So it's not that it's temporizing, it is truly a definitive replacement of the valve. Uh, and you know that begs the question, what exactly is aortic stenosis? How common is it? And why is TAVR such an important procedure? So a lot of people may cringe at the sight of anatomy lesson, but I think it's important to just re briefly review what the heart does and how it works uh, with a little visual. So, 
most of us know that the heart has chambers, has, have, the heart has four chambers, four main chambers. Um, and the aortic valve, basically it's a door from the heart to the rest of the body. So the main pumping chamber of the heart is here, it's called the left ventricle, and, heart, and the blood pumps through the aortic valve, which is here, to the aorta, to the rest of the body where it branches out. So this is looking at the outside of the heart, and this is looking at a cross section at the inside of the heart. So this valve opens and closes with every heartbeat. So when the heart squeezes, it opens, and when it stops squeezing and relaxes, it closes. And it's made of three leaflets. This is the top view of this aortic valve. So the heart beats about 100,000 times on average a day. So this valve opens and closes 100,000 times. So you can imagine over the years, there's wear and tear of this valve, of this, of this tissue. And as we age, um, many of us develop thickening of the leaflets. And in some cases, the thickening and calcification and the hardening of the leaflets is such that it causes restriction of the opening. And that's called aortic stenosis. Here's an example of what valves look like normally. So this is a normal aortic valve on the left side uh, in a younger person. And you can see here it is, three leaflets in an open, uh, sorry, closed state. And we're looking from the top down. And here it is in an open state. You can see that the valve fully closes and opens nice and wide, and the tissue looks nice and thin and pliable. And this is an example of a patient with aortic stenosis. So here the valve is in actually in an open state. So as opposed to nice and open heat like this, it's restricted. And these bulky, bulky pieces of material here are actually calcium. So calcium develops on the valve and restricts it from opening normally. And one can imagine that the heart is trying to squeeze through this tiny opening blood to the rest of the body and the, and the blood gets restricted, backs up, the pressure builds up in the heart and patients develop symptoms. Here's another example of a calcification and restricted valve, in a bicuspid valve, which means some patients are born with two leaflets as opposed to three and they can also develop an accelerated uh, aortic stenosis. So a clear difference between normal and abnormal. So who gets aortic stenosis? Well, aortic stenosis is traditionally uh, been considered a disease of, of the aging population. So as patients get older, they're more likely to develop aortic stenosis. So it's estimated about 3% of the population actually over 75 have aortic stenosis. So this is not a trivial number. You know, as the population ages, we all hear about the aging population, people are living longer, we're more likely to see a continuing rise of the incidence um, and prevalence, I should say, of aortic stenosis. Um, this is all valvular disease, uh, and aortic stenosis is, is, comes up to about 3%. So, well, why is that important? So, number one, aortic stenosis is, is a disease of people who tend to be older. Um, do we have to worry about it, meaning how, how severe it is and how, how much should we pay attention to this disease? Well, the bottom line is, is aortic stenosis, besides being common in older in aging people uh, can be very serious. And we know this from studies actually done a long time ago before uh, surgery was even an option. These are studies that done in the 60s. This is a very famous study which shows that once patients develop symptoms of aortic stenosis, so one can live with aortic stenosis for some period of time, which is indolent, but once symptoms develop, patients do very poorly. So once a patient has aortic stenosis and develops symptoms which can be you typically shorten so breath, chest pains, fainting episodes or near fainting episodes, heart failure, it's time to replace the valve, okay? So what actually happens though, it, when we look at the population, do, do these patients get their aortic valves replaced? Well, prior to 2010, there were a number of studies done which showed that in patients, this is a confusing slide, but follow me for a second, in patients who had aortic stenosis, who, should, who met indications to get it replaced. Only about half, aortic, AVR stands for aortic valve replacement. Only about half, more or less, actually got a valve replacement. So a full 50% did not get any definitive treatment for their disease process, despite the fact that it, could, it oftentimes is a deadly process. And why was that the case prior to 2010? Well, as I said, aortic stenosis tends to be more common in older people. And older people have a much higher risk of complications during open heart surgery. So this is, an exam this is a graph showing patients' mortality rates who undergo aortic valve surgery 
uh, with respect to their age. And as we see, as we get older, mortality rates get exponentially higher. And this is precisely the, the group of people that benefit from the procedure, the, the surgery, or the replacement, I should say. So we are, as physicians, our hands were tied. We wanted to offer treatment for this disease with replacing the valve, but the patients were just too high risk to undergo the proceed, to go undergo surgery. And then comes TAVR. So what is TAVR exactly? It's, it, as I said, it's a way of replacing the valve without having to do a full open heart procedure. So with open heart surgery, basic, basically the, the, the patient is on full support, full cardiopulmonary uh, bypass support. The chest is open, the heart is stopped, the heart is actually cut open. The old valve is taken out. It's a very big procedure, and you can imagine it's a very morbid procedure associated with a lot of complications, potentially, particularly in older people. With TAVR, the whole procedure, for the most part, is done through catheters. And these catheters, the main catheter is a tip usually placed in the groin because the femoral artery, which runs to, to our groins, is a large artery and large enough to accommodate the catheters needed to bring the valve up to the heart and place the, the new valve in the, where the old valve once was. And that's how a TAVR procedure works. Um, and this procedure oftentimes is performed not with general anesthesia, um, and oftentimes the patients can go home even the following day after the procedure, as opposed to open heart surgery, where patients, as one can imagine, need to stay in the hospital for several days, and the recovery uh, is often lo longer and, pro and prolonged. So many patients say, well, how do you get the valve in there? You know, how do you get a new valve within the old valve? How does it stay in place? How does it work? It just doesn't seem feasible. Well, a lot of technology has gone into these valves, and these are what the valves look like. And you can see there's a common sort of theme of these valves. These are the three valves that are currently approved in America, uh, made by three separate companies, Edwards, Medtronic, and Boston Scientific. And you can tell that they all have this stainless, or I should say this metal, um, frame called a stent on the outside, okay, as opposed to, and I'll, get, I'll come back to this slide, as opposed to traditional surgical valves which don't have this. So the way surgical valves work, w valves that are surgeons use to sew into place, um, they don't have any steel mesh as you could tell, and they're basically sewed into place with a sewing ring. They all have three leaflets that, like the, the, our native valves have. As opposed to TAVR valves, where the actual valve, these are animal valves, so these are either cow or porcine valves. These valves are sewed on the inside of this, of this um, stent, of this metal stent, and then the stent is crimped, so it's collapsed. So by collapsing it, and the animal tissue is, is collapsible, so the animal tissue can be squeezed and opened up with no damage. So this type of technology allows us to compress the, the stented valve completely and allowing its profile to be small enough so that we could place it through the femoral arteries and up to the heart and then re-expand it into place once it's in the right position. And the patient's old calcific valve, the native valve that was degenerated, actually forms a landing zone or a scaffold for the stent to sit in place. And that's why it doesn't move and functions normally and, and perfectly. So it's actually a very definitive um, creative technology to get a valve into the right position. Um, and as I said, there's three current co companies currently um, in the U.S. Who, who have valves that are FDA approved. Europe has many more. Many, many patients ask, well, how come Europe has more? Because Europe typically puts stuff on the market way sooner than Ameri Americans do, even though we may invent the technology. So a lot of our experience actually in the world comes from European experience first. Uh, but currently, we're right there. We have three valves available, and these have been FDA approved actually since 2011. So not all three of these, but in some capacity, a valve has been out there since 2011. So how does it work? I mentioned that th there's a catheter that goes up from the groin artery, up the aorta, to the heart. If you remember from your anatomy lesson I gave you about 10 minutes ago, the, uh, the aortic valve sits right here next to the left ventricle, the old aortic valve. You can see that this valve, this new bioprosthetic TAVR valve is in place, crimped. It's expanded. This particular valve expands with the balloon. We expand it. And once that valve is deployed, we remove the entire system except for the valve, of course. 
The procedure takes about 60 minutes um, from skin to skin and sometimes even quicker. So it's a very directed procedure, uh, and this is how we do it. So what about the aortic valve you know, universe, if you will, in the United States? Well, as I said, about in 2011, TAVR started to take off. Now, TAVR initially was first used only in sicker, older patients. So with any technology that's implemented, uh, implemented in medicine, it's usually using the sickest first, and older patients tend to be sicker. But I want to emphasize that, uh, and a lot of physicians don't even know this, that TAVR is not just for old, sick patients anymore. It was in 2011, but now basically TAVR is available and indicated for nearly every, anyone with aortic stenosis. So it used to be that the average age of patient population used to be in the mid-80s. Uh, and now it's about a decade younger than that. And I've done patients as young as late 30s, 40s uh, with a TAVR who needed the procedure. So it's no longer for only the old and the sick. It's for anyone who has aortic stenosis should at least be considered and be evaluated uh, by a team for potentially uh, be, uh, being a candidate for a TAVR. And we can see this explosion take place on this graph. So just look at this light blue line up here and this dark red line. In 2012, the dark, this, this blue line here represents surgical open procedures where the valves were surgically implanted. That number has stayed the same in America across the last decade, whereas this dark red line represents TAVR, which has basically exploded. And in 2019, it actually surpassed surgical, this is 2019, not even 2020, uh, 2019 it surpassed surgical valves and will continue to rise. So, you know, one important um, change in medicine, which in cardiology, if you will, which came out of TAVR, was the concept of a heart team. And this is a very important concept and very important for patients to understand what a heart team is, because this did not exist really in the same capacity prior to TAVR. And let me explain. So with teams have existed for a long time, you know, medical teams. And for instance, a transplant team, if a patient needed a, a kidney transplant, it wasn't one physician who the patient saw who decided whether or not a transplant should be done. It was a panel of physicians who met with the patient together and discussed the patient in a, in a panel format, in a meeting, if you will, to decide what the best treatment was for that patient. The same thing uh, uh, happens in the world of valvular disease now. As a patient, if you come to our hospital, if you come to Queens, and you have a valvular problem, such as aortic stenosis, you're not going to be seen just by one physician. You'll be seen by a group of physicians. The group of physicians is typically led by an interventional cardiologist, and that, that's who I am, and a cardiothoracic surgeon as well. We serve as you know, co-dictators or co-operators of the procedure. In addition, there are other team members who you will meet. There's a valve coordinator, so every patient who enters our uh, uh, valve clinic will be in touch and meet with a coordinator who will coordinate the care, um, who is knowledgeable about the procedure, and basically serves as a relay person to the for the entire system. You'll meet with the interventional cardiac and cardiothoracic surgeon uh, together. Uh, there's a whole, also a, a lot of other physicians involved in decision making which include imaging specialists, so echocardiographers, anesthesiologists, and others. Um, and all of these members of the team are important in deciding what the best treatment is possible. So in some cases, TAVR isn't the right treatment. In some cases, surgery is the right treatment. There are exceptions. And in some cases, no treatment is indicated. But this decision is not made by one physician alone with you. It'll be made by multiple, a whole team, which will discuss your case in unison. And this evolved at Queens over the last, you know, really, in my opinion, over the last decade, but certainly accelerated over the last two years. And over the last two years, we developed the heart, the heart team at Queens starting in early in 2018. Um, and this CAR team is, is, consists of all Wild Cornell physicians, such as myself. So for those of you who know, I am a, a Cornell physician, and my colleagues here are Cornell physicians. We do the, we've done procedures at Cornell, and we brought this technology to Queen. So it's a very exciting time. We did, despite the pandemic, we've done an, uh, we started our program this year, earlier this year, and and it's and basically it's running smoothly and um, and consists of the same Cornell team members um, throughout the Cornell network. So. 
for those of you who are wondering, like, how do I do this? Well, if I have an aortic stenosis problem, who do I call? Do you call me, the physician? Do you call uh, the coordinator? We like to say this, it's one-stop shopping. You call one number, you get in contact with the coordinator, and then we evaluate your valve condition, whatever it may be. A lot of patients don't even know what their valve conditions are. They're told they have a valve problem. They're told they have a murmur. And it's important to, to come to an institution with a team who will evaluate you, not just one, from one point of view, but from multiple points of view, both from a surgical point of view, an interventional point of view, and an imaging point of view. Okay, so I think I've gone beyond my 15 minutes. I do want to emphasize that questions are really important here because I told you a lot of information very quickly. I could speak for three hours about this. Uh, so, I'll, you know, uh, thank you very much for, for your time, and please ask any questions about any slides I've shown or any other topics uh, involving aortic valve disease. Thank you. That, that was truly incredible. I mean, I'm amazed that this technology is available. My father had a traditional open heart surgery to do a valve replacement and I'm blown away. So thank you for sharing, sharing that with us. Um, we do have some questions that I'd like to ask of you. Um, one question is how does a TAVR transcatheter heart valve and a surgical heart valve differ? Is one better than the other? So that's a good question because th those, that question was a, a probably the first question that was asked by physicians. You know, we, if we put the valve in, how is it gonna work? You know, it's not like we're actually visualizing with our hands on the heart and sewing the valve in. It turns out that these valves function very well. And in many ways, the hemodynamics of the valve, so the actual physiology of the valve from a flow standpoint is actually superior to that of a, of an aor of a surgically implanted valve. The reason for that is that the surgeon needs to um, actually sew in the valve, and that sewing ring takes up space in the aorta. And you can imagine it's a very small area. Whereas th these transcatheter valves would develop to occupy minimal space, so most of the space is occupied with the valve. So th the answer is they work just as well, if not better, than surgical valves from certain standpoints. Thank you for that. So another question, um, is general anesthesia required for the placement of the TAVR? So when we first started this technology, um, you know, eight, nine years ago, it's not more than that, every patient had general anesthesia because we felt that it was a, you know, we've considered a big procedure, we're changing, we're changing a heart valve, and it came traditionally out of, you know, we, we went from surgery to minimally invasive. That was eight, nine years ago. Now, over the last couple of years, our, our default is no general anesthesia. So we try to do these patients just with local anesthesia uh, and sedation. So the patients are not awake, um, but they're arousable. They don't remember the procedure, um, but they're not there. At any given time, they could be woken up. Uh, so right after the procedure is done, once the anesthesiologist lowers the the sleeping meds, if you will, uh, the patients wake up very quickly. So you can imagine the recovery because of that is even quicker. Um, sometimes we do do general anesthesia. Uh, in my opinion, there's no, it's not necessarily riskier. A lot of patients worry about, well, I don't want general anesthesia if I could help, but I wouldn't think like that. I would think that some patients who undergo TAVR benefit from having general anesthesia, particularly those with lung disease, ironically, because we have more control over their breathing process. But for the most part, it's gotten to be such a minimally invasive procedure that you don't need general anesthesia. Right. You mentioned about recovery time. So what is the recovery time? Um, you know, when do patients get to go home and how soon will they be able to resume normal activities? Right. So everyone's, uh, everyone's different, of course. Um, some patients take a little bit longer to recover. But our goal is to you know, in an uncomplicated patient, meaning a patient with not a lot of other comorbidities, um, we're oftentimes able to bring the patient in on the morning of the procedure and keep him in the hospital only for one night and send him home the next day. Wow. So sometimes our hospital stay is literally 24 to 30 hours. And that's our goal. Um, you know, a lot of patients even worry when they say that. They don't, they're like, don't send me out too soon. No, we're not going to send you out too soon. It's just that you really are by day one ready to, you're walking around, you're feeling great, and most patients feel better immediately. And assuming that you know, there's no other issues going on, 
that's how quickly we can get them out of the hospital. Many times, if, if older patients, patients with other medical problems, we keep them an extra day or we bring them the night before, but it's certainly not a prolonged process. And in terms of recovery, again, everyone recovers differently. You know, I usually say don't drive for a couple weeks just to be on the safe side. Have a family member with you for the first couple days. The patients who are working, you know, if you were working before, um, there's no reason to say you can't go back to work literally several days after your procedure. Um, in terms of full, full recovery, meaning if you want to, you know, run again and jog again and hike a mountain, um, you know, I usually just, to be on the safe side, tell patients to wait a few weeks before I see you in the office again. Um, but the bottom line is the recovery is quick. Incredible. So to compare that to a surgical procedure, how long is that until you leave the hospital even? Right. So surgery, you know, the, the a sternotomy is, is a large incision and it's a big procedure. Um, as you can imagine. Without going into the details of what entails a sternotomy, most patients could understand that when you have to go through the, the, the breastbone, open it up and close it back up again, there's a certain recovery time that just, no matter how young you are or healthy you are, that is involved. And that could take, you know, several weeks to really, in my opinion, months before you're back to, you know, doing whatever you want to do. Um, and it's not just that recovery. So the recovery is quicker with TAVR. It's, it's also the, the morbidity that's associated with it and the potential complications that are associated with it, which seem to be reduced with TAVR compared to open surgery, um, even in, in young patients. So it used to, the feeling was, well, if you're young, you know, you're, you're going to do well with surgery. Why not just have surgery? That's not the case anymore because patients who are even all patients seem to have, do better with TAVR uh, versus surgery, you know, arguably better with TAVR versus surgery. There are some subgroups that I still strongly recommend surgery because of anatomic reasons, but those are the minority of patients. Yeah, I would imagine that's incredible. So we have a question from an attendee. How do I know if I'm a candidate for a TAVR valve? Right, so I think the, the, that's a good question. Um, you know, and I mentioned the heart team uh, aspect of an evaluation. So it's important that when, you know, if you have a valve problem that is serious enough that your physician feels needs to be evaluated by specialists, that you get evaluated by a heart team. Um, because oftentimes it's, it, it can be nuanced, uh, meaning, you know, if you have aortic stenosis, how severe is the stenosis? What symptoms are you having? You know, and what are your comorbidities? And what are your preferences? So all that needs to be discussed at the time of visit. And in my opinion, you know, the, the Queen's model of having a team approach from the onset, you know, gives the patient the, the most, makes the, empowers the patient the most. I mean, you want, to, you want to empower the patient so the patient understands what's involved uh, and it's helped in making his or her decision. So, um, you know, my, my answer to your question, how, how do you know, you, you, you know by after discussions with a, with a heart team physician, um, you know, what your options are. So you just noted about the team approach and about it being, you know, New York Presbyterian Queens. So can you tell us, you know, why choose, obviously there's a, there's a, a distinction. So why choose New York Presbyterian Queens for TAVR? Well, I think, you know, I have had the benefit of, of, um, of, of being throughout the NYP system through the whole evolution of, of TAVR. I like to think that, you know, we started our program here uh, with the knowledge I've had of what works and doesn't work. And I think that, you know, what we do is we make it user-friendly, patient-friendly, um, and we empower the patient. You know, we want the patient to understand that this is a team. You're, the patient, him or herself, is part of that team. You know, that slide, I, I meant to say that there should be one little niche in there uh, besides the physician and the radiologist and such is the patient because the patient is a value is is the member is the most valuable member of that decision making team, and um, you know we're not going to make necessarily the decision behind closed doors for you. We're going to make it with you, you know, with open doors and, and describe to you, you know, why we think this is the best approach or why we don't want to do it. You know, a lot most of the time, you know, when a patient comes in the clinic, we don't do a TAVR right away. So and we need to tell the patient why we're not doing it, why you don't need this procedure, and why it's safe to wait or, you know, just treat you as you're being treated. So that's important, um, you know, basically not just 
telling a patient you need this done, but also this discussing with him or why you may not need it, need it done and what follow-up is needed to follow the, the, the disease. Because a lot of patients come early on, their, their primary care doctors may pick up a murmur, they may have mild aortic stenosis. So, you know, when you come to our, our we're not just here to do tabers, we're here to, to discuss with you your condition. And oftentimes patients come earlier on in their disease process where they don't need immediate mechanical intervention or TAVR. And that's equally as important to treat those patients and, and educate those patients as the patients who need a TAVR right away. So not only do you have the tremendous expertise yourself as well um, at New York Presbyterian Queens, but also the focus on empowering the patient to make the right decision for themselves. That's right. That's yes. So we have another question from an attendee. Um, what are the risks of the TAVR procedure and how do they compare? I think you touched a little bit upon that, but I guess someone wants a little bit more information on that, how they compare the open heart surgery in terms of. Right, so you know, there, there's the risk, I usually quote about a 2% risk of, 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 a, of a major complication overall, and that includes the sickest of the sick. That number has inc incrementally decreased over the years. And these are not irreparable you know, uh, uh, damages that occur, but they are potential complications, which include you know, bleeding complications, vascular complications, stroke complications, and such. Overall, these risks are lower than that of surgery, arguably lower. If you look at the, the data, there's many, as you can imagine, there's many trials looking at this, at this data. And certainly, they're not higher than surgery. And in many aspects, such as risk of stroke, they're lower than surgery. But it's a moving target. So we have newer technology. So one of, the, one of the most dreaded risks of any vascular procedure, any procedure where you're in the vasculature, heart surgery, transcatheter procedure, is stroke. So, um, you know, and that's what we don't want to happen, obviously. Um, TAVR seems to have a lower incidence of stroke than open surgery. But that, that incidence is, continues to, you know, like I said, it's a moving target. We've, the, the, we've had new, we have technologies that are, currently being used to prevent or help prevent strokes from occurring. Um, actually, I think I have, I have one slide which I have to show because it's, it's really neat. Um, I got to share again. Yeah, please. Um, sorry. I hope you could see this. So since that was mentioned, Okay, so this this is this is a complicated slide. I forgive forgive me, but um, we have a we have a, a device which actually um, and it's very easy to use. It sounds complicated, but it's very easy. So, as I said, someone asked about complications. In my opinion, st stroke is a, is a complication that we want to have a zero percent incidence of always. And we have a device now that's available, which is being used. Uh, and it's a device with it that's placed actually in the arteries that supply blood to your head, namely the carotid arteries. Um, and these are little baskets that are placed in the arteries that catch any debris which may embolize off the valve, which can go to the head. That's how a stroke occurs. A stroke occurs by particles um, embolizing off of a valve, either spontaneously uh, or from the procedure to the head. It's, it's rare, but it can happen. But to make it even rare, we have this device to catch the debris before it goes to the head. And the hope is that this will dramatically decrease the incidence of, of strokes um, in this procedure. So, you know, to answer your question, the incidence of, of procedures overall tends to be lower in TAVR versus surgery, and there's newer techniques uh, available to reduce complications such as stroke um, and such. So those pictures were great. Do you have anything that you can show us of the actual valve being placed or inserted? Oh, sure. I think I do. Um, I have to share again. So I think you could see this. Is that correct? Yes, we can. Perfect. All right. So uh, just for a quick visual. So this is... Um, Many of you probably could tell this is, looks like a, some sort of weird x-ray, um, uh, and it is. So we do this procedure under x-ray guidance and ultrasound guidance. So this is a procedure that was done uh, quite a while ago, um, but it, it actually is, exemplifies what's done. So we have an echo 
probe here. An echo is an ultrasound. So the one physician looks at the heart with an ultrasound. And this is when I mentioned the team approach because it's not just one operator who's doing a surgical procedure. It's operators acting together, not only in the evaluation of the patient, but in the actual procedure itself. So here we have an echocardiographer. This is the echo probe, if you will. So I'll just go ahead. This is what the echocardiographer looks at as I, the interventional cardiologist, look at this, okay? And here is, remember I showed you that crimped valve, what it looks like crimped, it looks collapsed? Yes. So at the beginning of this, of this um, video, it's in its crimped state right here. So here it is collapsed within the old valve. And as I run this, you'll see it expand and open up into place with this balloon, just like I showed in the previous slides. And then once that valve is expanded and deployed, we take, we take this whole balloon out and the whole delivery system out, and we're left with this valve on the right side in place. Wow. Okay, not running, but that's what it looks like in place. Okay, so we go from this, and that's how we're able to get something this size in. Now this is about an inch in diameter. Um, it's about you know anywhere from 20 to 29 millimeters, which is more or less an inch. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, and, and you're an inch. It, it's too big to get in in a non-crimped state, but by crimping it, we reduce it dramatically, um, so we could get an invert actually quite easily. Wow! Thank you for showing us this. Stop sharing. Wow, I'm truly blown away. This is incredible technology. And I mean, I can only imagine what a difference it makes for patients to go to New York Presbyterian Queens and feel empowered and feel heard and be able to have a procedure that, um, that is as advanced as this and minimally invasive. And patients, the, the great thing about this procedure is patients feel better pretty much right, right away. Wow. So um, most of them describe as this, this weight lifted off their chest. Uh, I've heard that more than once. But the 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 it's Literally an immediate and figuratively. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's an immediate improvement because if you if you if you think of it, you have the heart that's beating against this this constricted orifice that is immediately opened up from inside, and there's no trauma in getting to that spot. So the only trauma is minimal down in the groin, and that heals up quickly. So up in the chest, there, there are no scars, there's no cutting, there's no healing that has to take place. So when patients wake up, you know, right after the procedure, they feel better uh, pretty quickly. I mean, and when I say quickly, I mean literally immediately. Uh, so it's very gratifying to see uh, as a physician that you're able to do this uh, so effectively. Mm, incredible. So I wanted to, I did put in the chat there, the New York Presbyterian Queens Heart Valve Center, but the number again is 718-670-2485. It is in the chat. I will also include it in the follow-up email that will go out to all of our attendees. Dr. Minutello, thank you so much for this incredible information and educating us on TAVR. I really appreciate it. I um, want to thank our attendees for being here with us and um, having sharing this wonderful opportunity. So thank all you. Right, great. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. And thanks, thanks for all the attendees. And uh, I hope everyone learned something from this. Um, and uh, thanks a lot. Absolutely. I'm truly bl blown away. Thank you to New York Presbyterian Queens. Thank you to Dr. Mignutello. Thank you to all our attendees. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Take care. Bye-bye.